This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Uh, thank you very much, Chris, and I deal with a lot of AKI, mostly from Chris's patients, so we uh, have a long history together. Uh, AKI, these are the teaching points I want, want to actually make here. AKI is, a, is primarily secondary to either sepsis or ischemic reperfusion injury, and that's most commonly surgery or contrast media. Uh, we used to call it acute tubular necrosis, and it, its name changed to AKI. I think actually we may need to change the name back to the original thing because we've learned in fact that AKI is basically a form of necrosis or apoptosis or regulated necrosis. Now these are different pathways that are activated in a setting of either particularly ischemic reperfusion injury and or sepsis. And I'll talk about what the difference is between necroptosis and regulated necrosis because they op, uh, have different metabolic pathways. The second point, AKI is a systemic disease, and renal cell death or necrosis releases what we call dangerous associated molecular pattern molecules. These are recognized as non-self molecules by the innate immune system and trigger a primary innate immune response that leads to uh, inflammation in distal organs, otherwise known as inflama inflammatory organ crosstalk. Now in our, our setting, most of the time, AKI, the death in that setting is not caused by the AKI because if the patient has a blood pressure that's sustainable, I can dialyze that person. Uh, death in that setting is either, either because of sepsis or distal organ failure, particularly pulmonary, cardiopulmonary failure. And I'll talk about some new stuff that we've done the last few years, which I think is we've identified as a potential druggable target. That's a, a term that's become very popular if you're trying to pitch a, a new product. Uh, we've actually isolated an intracellular isoform of matrix metalloproteinase 2, which is an enzyme that I'm sure is very familiar in terms of vascular remodeling to this audience, uh, but which looks like it actually is a pro predominant cause of acute tubular necrosis. So AKI, we used to think, as I mentioned before, that ATP depletion was, leads to non-regulated necrosis. But we now know, that in fact, necrosis is not random. It's actually regulated. One form of necrosis that's the most common I see other than sepsis is ischemic reperfusion injury. Now, ischemic reperfusion injury causes major oxidative stress, and a major target organelle is actually mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, so when you actually reperfuse an organ, you get a very large burst of oxidative reactive mo molecules, which cause, directly cause uh, in, uh, destruction to lipids and proteins, but they also activate uh, inflammatory pathways. Now, necroptosis is actually, this word's been out for mm, about five or six years in terms of the renal literature. This is a form of necrosis that's triggered by death receptor activation. So this is like, for instance, TNF or other pro-inflammatory cytokines. And this is a pathway that's particularly important for sepsis-associated AKI. But we now know, in fact, if particularly with ischemic reperfusion injury, you can actually cause the mitochondria to depolarize. They rupture inside the cell. They release their own mitochondrial DNA and trigger an innate immune reaction because mitochondrial DNA is actually bacterial DNA. So you actually uh, have an intracellular innate immune response that causes cell death. So this is a kind of a show sort of the feedback loop you get in terms of like the sepsis sort of syndromes. Basically you have inflammatory cytokines that bind to death associated receptors that trigger necroptosis. On the other hand, you actually have settings like with the loss of the mitochondrial permeability transition, and particularly I'm talking about ischemic perfusion injury, these cells rupture, they release damps into the molecule and cause a systemic uh, and self-amplifying inflammatory response. And this is really why uh, cardio, uh, cardiac function is depressed uh, and pulmonary function is depressed in the setting of AKI. So I've been working with these uh, enzymes since I wrote my first paper, I'm ashamed to say, in 1982 on this area. 
Um, I kept thinking I would be done with it, but I'm, I'm still working on it. Either I'm a very slow learner or there's something interesting here. But MMP2 is rapidly induced in ischemic reperfusion injury in multiple target organs. That includes not only the kidney, but the heart and the lung. We've now disturbed, I uh, talk about two discrete isoforms of MMP2. One is the original, which is secreted, and an intracellular isoform, which we found four or five years ago. Now we know that the full length MMP2 disrupts the basement membrane, and if you disrupt the basement membrane to setting an AKI, the tuber epithelial cells can't regenerate, and so basically the kidney cannot repair itself. There's also a loss of peritubular capillaries. This is really serious because we now know that in terms of AKI, AKI pre predicts that you will actually progress to CKD, and it's the most likely mechanism is you have peritubular ischemia from loss of these capillaries, so you trigger an irreversible pro-inflammatory response. I'll show you some work that this actually, this new isoform triggers regulated necrosis. And we do know from earlier studies that non-selective inhibition of MMP2 or the knockout mouse, they have lesser forms of ischemic reperfusion injury, both in the heart and the kidney. And I'll talk about where we're at in terms of actually refining this as a target uh, for uh, prevention or possibly treatment of AKI. So this is, I just want to focus on, this is, a, this is just the first exon and first, second exon of MMP2. Uh, basically, this is the full length of MMP2. Uh, this slide summarizes about five years worth of work, but we basically found a smaller form of MMP2 in mitochondria of an, either aging animals, both in the heart and the kidney, or following ischemic reperfusion injury. And after a lot of work, we actually found, in fact, there's an alternate promoter in the first intron that is not active in the normal situations, but is induced in the setting of ischemia reperfusion or hypoxia. It generates a truncated form of MMP2 that stays in the cell. It's enzymatically active. It goes to mitochondria, and it cleaves at least eight mitochondrial proteins, including ATP synthase, which is something you probably really shouldn't cleave. So to first to test this, I'm going to show you some human data that actually confirms that this actually takes place in people. But we've generated transgenic mice to actually expressing the internal truncated isoform. This is basically a tuber epithelial cell that's actually undergoing regulated necrosis. And this is without any superimposed injury. So this in and of itself is sufficient to trigger tuber epithelial cell regulated necrosis. And if you actually follow these mice over time, they develop tubular atrophy, severe tubular atrophy, which is associated with DNA fragmentation, which is very characteristic of regulated necrosis. And what was interesting, we first found this isoform in hearts and kidneys of older mice. Now, these are just normal middle-aged mice, like many people in this room. Um, and we basically did not manipulate these mice whatsoever, but this is a, a four-month-old mouse. This is a 14-month-old mouse, which is equivalent to about a 50-year-old person. Uh, and you can basically see that there's a very nice expression of this truncated variant. And you can see this sort of filamentous expression here. That's typical of mitochondrial localization. So we set up a model of unilateral ischemic reperfusion injury. Uh, most people are using bilateral models, but the unilateral model has the advantage that it's not lethal. And you can actually follow these mice out for weeks or months. Um, and what we did is we did a unilateral model with a limited amount. This is a wild type. This is the control. And this is the uh, one that got a ischemic reperfusion injury. There's a, we titered this so there's, a, there's what we would term mild to moderate tubular dilatation and cast formation. But what was really interesting when we did the same thing to the transgenic mice expressing the truncated variant, you can see, in fact, the injury is much more severe. In other words, expression of the NTT intracellular isoform primes the kidney for more severe AKI injury. And what was also interesting is this is the contralateral kidney, which was not clamped. You can see, in fact, and this is at 96 hours, there's a lot of injury in this. And this represents release of these damps into the circulation, going to the contralateral kidney, and causing uh, injury in this, uh, this as well. Now, if you follow these, uh, this, is, uh, this is, again, the wild type. And we, we titered this so that this is the picker series red stain for fibrosis. You can see, in fact, because I titered this for very mild energy, there's uh, injury. There's really not that much fibrosis in here. But I think you can see, uh, looking at the transgenic mouse, it's pretty dramatic. There's a huge increase in uh, fibrosis in these mice. In other words, expression of this intracellular isoform makes these kidneys exquisitely sensitive to a level of injury that actually doesn't have much effect on the wild type. 
And I actually have a hypothesis that this may be one of the reasons, since many of the patients I have to dialyze at work are elderly, they've undergone a what would, wouldn't bother a 20-year-old in terms of causing renal injury, they develop AKI requiring dialysis, and I actually think this may be the pathway. So to show you some human data, we decided to look at delayed graft function. Delayed graft function is an operative di diagnosis. A person gets a transplant and requires hemodialysis within the first week. Uh, but it's the purest form of renal ischemic reperfusion injury because you know the, the moment the injury was the, the moment, they, in fact, they, they hooked the kidney up to the uh, recipient circulation. And we actually had several hypotheses that the MMP2 would be involved in delayed graft function. Uh, and that they are rational targets for selective inhibition, and it represents an attractive proof of mechanism study population. This is a much smaller subset of the large universe of patients with ischemia, uh, acute ischemic AKI, but this would be, it's a cleaner population to actually do an initial clinical trial. So this actually is what we did is, uh, this is an archival biopsy study, and we basically set up an injury scale. These are H and E's, and you can see, in fact, this is zero, one, two, and three. You can see, in fact, there's increasing tubular dilatation and inflammation in, in these kidneys. And we, these are serial sections. They're stained for the truncated variant and the full-length variant. And there's a couple of points to make here. The, both isoforms are expressed in precisely the same renal segment. And these renal segments where it's expressed are the ones that actually have the injury. This is really key. In other words, this is coordinated expression of both isoforms, and expression of those isoforms is actually where the tubular injury takes place. Oops. So I talked about peritubular, uh, loss of peritubular capillaries as a cause of progression. So this is basically, a, this is a normal person. This is, you can see, in fact, there, there's abundant numbers of peritubular capillaries around the kidney. Remember, the tubular epithelial cells have the highest oxygen requirement other than the heart and the forebrain because of all the transport activity. And this is a typical case of the uh, DGF. You can see, in fact, that they're, they're ba basically dropped out by at least half. In other words, this kidney probably will have a very poor, poor prognosis in terms of one to two year uh, graft survival due to progression to CKD caused by loss of capillaries. So to summarize, I've talked about the uh, expression of two discrete isoforms is directly associated with tubular injury in human delayed graft function, which is, I, I believe, is a model, a clinical model of the bigger universe of human AKI. We showed there's a linear relationship between the transcripts for these isoforms and the extent of tubular injury. The unilateral model recapitulates the finding with human DGF. So the human DGF is an association study, but the transgenic study is actually a mechanistic study showing a direct link between expression and injury. And we actually have a pretty good clue about what is being degraded in there, and it offers us biomarkers to see, in fact, for a clinical trial where we can actually show efficacy by knocking down MP2, do we have a reduction in uh, relevant biomarkers? So I believe this is a druggable target. This is maybe the isoform, the truncated isoform has maybe the best single therapeutic target to reduce the severity of DGF and potentially AKI. We're currently developing an siRNA strategy to selectively knock down these isoforms in the proximal tubule cells. We can actually probably do this. And if possible, positive, I think we'll actually see about getting some funding to go forward to preclinical development. And I'd like to acknowledge I uh, had a lot of help doing this project. Thank you very much.